Thank you. So this works, right? Can you hear me? Okay. So um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. I know this is the last talk of the day, and you probably can wait to go out and you know grab a beer. So I'm going to try to make this worth your while. Um, as you heard, this is my first Red Docs. I've been uh, following and admiring this amazing community for a while now from the sidelines, and I learned a lot from you. So I thought, you know, maybe I can give back to the community by talking about something that I find uh, really important, and maybe it will be interesting and useful to some of you as well. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm going to tell you a secret. I'm very nervous. <laughs> and also, I'm obviously not a native speaker, so if I start babbling too fast or if you can't understand what I'm saying, just raise your hand and ask me to repeat, so I'll, I'll do that. Um, and yeah, I wanted to uh, thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity um, and for organizing such a welcoming conference. And also, uh, a massive thanks to these ladies here who are doing the live uh, transcribing. That's an incredible job. Let's give them a applause. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, uh, my name is Ivana, this is my Twitter handle, please follow me. I will share my slides also there, so. Um, I'm a writer and translator from Croatia, and as you heard, I care deeply about free and open source software, about software freedom, and I contribute to the KDE community <coughs> as a promo contributor. Uh, so if anyone here uses Linux or Plasma desktop in particular, we can be friends. Uh, my current job is at a software security company called Reversing Labs in Croatia. Uh, we have some really cool technology, really cool pro products that do malware analysis and detection. They take a file and take it apart to the, down to the tiniest bits and tell you, you know, this is malicious, what this can do to your system. Um, and my experience um, as the first and only technical writer at this company is something I'm sure a lot of you can relate to. You know, doing everything on your own from the ground up, building a you know, a style guide because the company doesn't have one, stuff like that. Um, I choose to call myself a documentation developer because I do more than just writing the docs. I also maintain the tools we use and work on improving the docs building process. In short, I subscribe to the docs as code approach. Um, the company is also hiring, so if you or any, anyone you know would like to work as a Python developer or in data mining, you can ask me about it after the talk. And what is this talk going to be about? Well, um, um, I'm going to share some ideas and strategies for documenting situations when software doesn't really work the way it should. Uh, I will only talk about documenting software issues uh, because I'm not qualified to give advice on other industries, but maybe some of this advice can be abstracted and applied to other fields as well. Um, sorry. The idea is to provide something for everyone, so uh, some comfort. The new documentarians who might have not uh, you know, encountered this before, and believe me, you will. Uh, and also some food for thought for experienced documentarians and maybe some motivation for them to share their experience and advice with the rest of us. Um, so yeah, it's uh, truth universally acknowledged that every software has bugs. And it's our job and duty uh, to make sure users are informed of these bugs and how they can affect them. Uh, this idea of duty and documentarian responsibility is one of the underlying topics of this talk. So, of course, there are different types of bugs, and we don't have time to go through all of them. So I just picked up four instances uh, when, I, when technical writers are faced with a challenge of documenting something that doesn't work. The first case is pretty simple and straightforward. It's a bug. So everyone knows it's a bug, everyone agrees it's a bug, it's reported and it will be fixed, we just don't know when. So it may be in the next release, maybe uh, the one after that. So here we usually rely on, re on the release notes uh, where we put a list of known issues. This works for short release cycles uh, or when you know a bug will be fixed soon. Uh, in cases when you don't know when it's gonna be fixed uh, or when software only gets one version per year or situations like that, it might be a good idea to put it into the docs themselves. So here you should always consider whether the bug is critical or not um, and appropriately highlight that information. Mm, so the second case, it's the infamous it's a feature. So according to Wikipedia, this is actually the original instance 
in the first mention of this phrase uh, in the Usenet, Usenet message from 1984, I think. So yeah, a long time ago. Um, so what this means, it's that the developer, manager, or other parties involved in the release process do not think a bug is worth fixing or do not acknowledge it as a bug. So the decision is made not to fix it, but it still remains in the software. So whatever it is, maybe it's an actual defect where something doesn't work as the user would expect it to, or some additional byproduct behavior of an action. So one way to solve this would be by providing workarounds to users. So you can have a section in the docs that describes scenarios which trigger the bug and then explain how to go around it. So don't forget to describe the actual intended goal, how the software should perform, if or how it would perform if the bug wasn't there. So um, when describing this limitation or the problem, uh, try to use positive language as much as possible without trying to make it sound like you're minimizing the problem. So try to find that balance. Um, it's a good idea to include a disclaimer for the workaround. Obviously, it doesn't come with the uh, with the guarantee stability uh, as the rest of the built-in official features do. So make sure to warn the users if, for example, your support policies do not cover cases when the user has applied a, a workaround. Also, don't make promises or say this will be fixed in the next release if you know it won't. That's kind of a Captain Obvious remark, but I thought I should mention it anyway. <laughs> so, Next case is the one when the UX is a mess. So this may not be due to a bug, but just because the software does not follow usability standards or the interface is just not consistently designed. Or, you know, just super confusing nonsense like this. So that's from a website called User Onboard uh, Teardowns. I think I actually found that link on the Write the Docs Slack, but they do this great analysis and highlight all kinds of usability issues in software. So do you see this first remark? Do you remember the first talk of the day? <laughs> Him. So um, never say that it's simple or that the user should just do this because if it really was that simple and obvious, you wouldn't need a workaround, right? You wouldn't need to describe it. So what you can do in this case when the UX is a mess, um, you can provide tips or hints on how to more efficiently use the interface without exposing you know, this bad design for what it is. You don't have to explicitly say this is badly designed, <laughs> just provide some um, alternative workflows. You can describe, you know, better user workflows than the default ones, so to say. Um, so part of this also includes documenting for accessibility, even if the interface itself doesn't pay much attention to it. For example, maybe your software supports keyboard shortcuts, but this is not indicated anywhere in the, in the user interface. Um, so you can make it visible in the docs so the people who can't use a mouse uh, have a way to work with the software efficiently using the keyboard. Or you can provide tips on how to zoom into a particularly small part of the interface or you can have big screen bigger screenshots in the docs that show some text that it's really small in the interface itself. Um, so yeah, address user expectations. So users expect some things from the interface and maybe they sometimes don't get it so you can find a way to fix this in the docs. So for example, they, they expect feedback when they submit a form or click a button, so you can explain what happens when they do these actions. Uh, they want to reduce repetitiveness, perform bulk actions. If it's not intuitive how, how to perform some kind of a bulk action in the interface, you can explain this. Um, they also want options to cancel or get out of somewhere safely. Um, they also want uh, indirect manipulation. So what this means, you know, they want commands that they're not directly part of your software. For example, in a web application, they expect to be able to copy text using control C because that's the usual, you know, keyboard shortcut they would use in other uh, browser applications. They also ha expect helpful error messages that tell them what's the next step. So if the user interface of your software is missing all these things, it's not satisfying user expectations, you can try to fix this in the docs. And now the last issue, it's not so much a software bug itself, 
but a problem in communication between managers, marketing department, and tech writers. So I don't know um, if it has ever happened to you, but for me it has. Someone higher up um, wants you to lie about a feature being available in the software, although it's not, or they want you to not disclose a bug or even worse, a security vulnerability because it will make us look bad. So my question is, what's worse, looking bad because we had a bug or because we lied and intentionally misled our customers? So Tom Johnson, I'm not sure if it's, he's here, but yeah, he has this wonderful blog called I'd Rather Be Writing, which I personally think should be mandatory reading in every writing college course. <laughs> yeah, he, he described a very similar situation in his blog. Um, and yeah, this quote is actually from him. So um, what, if, you know, what if the word about this thing that you're hiding somehow gets out and people start writing about it on the internet, you know, on forums, on their blogs? You will lose control over the discourse and trust of users will be lost. So when you're asked to do things like this, if, you know, if ever a manager or someone from the marketing asks you to lie about stuff because it's good for the sales, um, you need to convince the person who told you that just how terrible, terrible, <laughs> terrible, terrible idea that is. Um, and you know, try to make them understand all the legal implications of these actions if they are unable to understand the moral ones. Um, you know, there are also business related implications of those things because transparency, it helps stakeholders um, and users make big decisions. A very simple example is, you know, there is a bug in a new version, it will affect our decision to upgrade to the software. So the user needs to know. Um, of course, this doesn't mean that you will go around the whole process and, you know, disclose things that are damaging to your own company. Um, all I want you to do is think about the ethical implications of your actions. How far are you willing to go when asked to do something like this? What is at stake in your situation that can help you make the final decision? One thing to remember is that you can always say no. You can and you should have the right to refuse to do something that goes against the standard practices of your craft and against the ethical values of your profession. There's a really good lightning talk on this topic from this year's Red Dogs Portland. It's called It's Okay to Say No by Ben Fisher. So if you haven't seen it, I recommend you check it out. So you may be thinking, why bother? <laughs> Is it really worth you invest so much time and energy and possibly risk losing your job over documenting some bugs? Well, um, I personally think it matters if we want to be professional and uphold standards because we owe it to our users to provide clear, precise, correct information that doesn't hide truth and with, ambig with ambiguity and doesn't manipulate the data. Uh, it matters also because your company can be sued for damages due to undisclosed information, no matter how many disclaimers you put in the docs. It also matters because it helps other people in your company. It helps your support teams because they can refer to your documentation you know, as it says, document workarounds reduce support requests. It also paves the way to establishing positive communication patterns in your company when people are transparent and clear with each other about the work they are doing. Why this is important? Well, because we want to avoid situations like this. So, communicate. When communicating with users, don't waste their time and money. Don't hide facts. Don't mask them with ambiguity. Documentation is not meant to sell the product, so don't describe the software as the best in the world unless you have some solid, unbiased data to prove it. And avoid words that can be interpreted as you're trying to shift the blame for a software defect or to minimize the impact of some problem. So, I mean, in short, that means um, communicate ethically, don't mislead your readers. Always make warnings in the docs as visible as possible, especially if they, if they can cause loss of data or any other kind of damage to the user. Also, um, 
try to find a balance between not, between not enough disclosure and too much disclosure. So this refers to confidentiality as mentioned previously, uh, but also to the amount of detail you choose to provide about a particular bug. So obviously not all bugs are important enough to be documented um, and explained. And perhaps the most important, don't give up. Uh, be persistent. If you've ever played fetch with a dog, you know what persistence is. <laughs> so even if you're sometimes forced to act against your ethical principles, keep fighting for what you think is right. And keep doing whatever is in your power to make the users happy. Because that's uh, what we all want to do, right? So yeah, that's pretty much it from me. Thank you.